Okay, so Major Frizzell, first of all, thanks for talking to the students at the University of Waterloo. Uh, my first question for you is, uh, you're the area commander for the Salvation Army here in uh, Sarasota, Florida. Can you tell me what led you to this role and uh, what it involves? So in the Salvation Army system, we are assigned to an appointment. And so uh, simply one day someone calls up and says, uh, you will be moving in three weeks to be the area commander in Sarasota, Florida. But what got us to this role is we've been Salvation Army officers for 18 years, and the Salvation Army uses a system of development of its officers. So usually you start in a smaller command, a smaller community, with less responsibilities. And if you do reasonably well uh, in those, then you go to a larger command, again, with more responsibilities. Uh, and it keeps increasing. The area command designation uh, means simply that uh, we, one, have a, a large social service operation, but also that we have two faith ministries that we're responsible as well, that as an area commander you become responsible for other officers uh, in the Salvation Army, and so that's where that designation comes, but it comes after uh, many years of experience uh, and, uh, and some form of success uh, along the way. Thank you, and uh, so you're planning to establish the Journey of Hope Family Village uh, and uh, to help with homelessness in Sarasota. Uh, can you first describe the issue of homelessness here? Uh, wh what's it like in Sarasota? So Sarasota is a tremendous community. Uh, it has great affluence and it has very difficult poverty. And the issue is, is that most of our housing is based on a New York market, whereas our incomes are based on a Florida market. And so the gap between income and fair market rent is significant. After the 2005 recession, one thing that happened is many people who had homes uh, with, who ended up in mortgage crisis ended up back in the rental market. That high demand on the rental market drove rent prices up at every level. And that means that those who are on the lower end of income had a greater difficulty getting into rental spaces. And so even small spaces, places that used to be uh, not very nice apartments, now are condos because people are pleased to live here. But with that conversion, those who used to be able to afford those apartments now are in smaller places. So the crisis for families is, is how do you gain enough income in order to be able to afford the market and stabilize your family uh, across the seasons? And across the seasons, what I'm referring to is we have very much an in-season, we call it season, and off-season. And the difference is, is when wonderful people from Canada and all over the central U.S. come down to Sarasota uh, for the winter. Most, many of our, our people that we serve are able to get two or three jobs, uh, get money, get housing. But in the off-season, when you have off-season and underemployment, housing becomes a, a real crisis. And what we're looking at with the village is how do we stabilize families, essentially, for two off-seasons. Interesting. And so can you describe your vision for the village and, and how it will act to improve people's lives? Absolutely. What we see is, is that the, the village gives an opportunity for families to stabilize. Now the fundamental issue is, is the housing issue, is how do you help someone have, have housing. At the Salvation Army we have a program for those who are in recovery from alcohol and drug addiction. Uh, in that program at any one time, uh, a third to a half have children in the area. What we recognize is, is families in crisis have children in crisis. And so, when we have people who have children in the area come out of the program, they then have to look for housing. Many of them, if their children are in foster care, or their children are living with family, have to show that they're stable roughly six months before they're allowed their children back. So that means they have to move out once to show they're stable, and then once they get their child, they typically need to move again so that they have a quality place for their child to live. That's moving twice in one of the most expensive housing markets in the state. Moving twice is near impossible. So how do you create a village that allows a parent who is doing well in recovery and in employment to, to pay a market rate cost on a smaller place? So the, village, the, the vision for the village is, is 220, 340, 460, and 580, 580 square foot apartments so that people can move up in community into housing that they can afford and allow them to be ready to move into the market on their own. So this is not, the idea of this is not necessarily affordable market, it's actually market rate at smaller space. 
which in itself could be argued makes it affordable, but not uh, overly subsidized. So the first issue is the housing, but the second issue is the social momentum of the parent. We know that if you can help a parent increase their income by $3,000, or if the parent will, will work on their education, again, both issues that can, can deal with the off-season, then that parent uh, is likely to stabilize because the social momentum of the parent will keep increasing uh, once they experience the beginning of it, right? It's, a, it's a, the law of inertia socially. The second part is, in, in, when it comes to the family, and for us as a priority, is the development of the child. One of the things that we know is that children of, uh, children of families in crisis are more likely to be in crisis themselves. We see the average age of those coming into the homeless shelter decreasing over and over because sometimes children do not have the opportunities to succeed. So the important part of the village is the community itself that focuses on child development. Is what child development issues have come as really a housing issue and or addiction issue or social issue of the parent and how can we as a community focus on that child allowing them the development skills and the time to, to extend their natural strengths so that they can achieve. So the, the first goal is the simple housing of the family. The second goal is the social momentum of the parent. But the third goal and most importantly is the development of the child so that the child will not be a future resident of the Salvation Army. Thank you. And so I'm especially interested in how you'll manage the stakeholders who are associated uh, with the project. Can you tell me uh, who the stakeholders are and uh, what their various interests might be? Absolutely. So in years past, uh, often programs like this would be designed, you'd have an architect build a building with a couple of experts, you'd have an expert write a program, and then you would open the building. Uh, this is not that day. So this program is designed to engage all stakeholders first, in, which we do in all of our meetings, is we have people who live with us in all of our, in, in all of our planning meetings. Is how do you actually ask the people who live with us what they need. And even in the design of even in the design of the, the need statement, we had meetings here at the Salvation Army with the parents downstairs and said, okay, what do the numbers look like for you in your life? And that's how we got to, to this. The other stakeholders, of course, are those who will make donations. As people who make donations want to make sure that this is both life changing and or life saving is how is this a good investment of their philanthropic dollars into the lives of others. This for us is not a matter of charity, this is a matter of philanthropy because it changes generations. Uh, then another stakeholder group that we have, of course, is your, your government entities and your political entities, is does it fit the goodwill of the community, it does it fit the social order of the community as well. And then thankfully we have great partners in the nonprofit community and the service provider community. So the Salvation Army does not expect that we'll create a village where we automatically gain the expertise needed for social momentum or child development, although we have skills in both places. But how do we create learning cycles that allow those with expertise to engage the system? So as we look at the, at the project itself and the different stakeholders, one of the cultural elements that we're focusing on is creating a center for learning, both for the individual parent, for the child, but also for the village itself and the stakeholders in it. Interesting. Uh, so how will you manage the stakeholders? What's the approach? that you're going to take to that? We believe in, in overly being transparent. Everything from the land choices to the program design will be done in community. We're using, uh, we are moving into a design phase next year and we will use design flexibility. What design flexibility does, it allows us to say that one, there's more than one way to approach or construct the, the proposed solution. And in that, then, we will have meetings, obviously, with volunteer advisory boards of those who are, are uh, close stakeholders of the Salvation Army. But then we'll also open those up into community meetings so that we can say, here's our first considerations into the community. What, what do you think about that? We need to make sure that we're listening to all parties because often wisdom is found in the outliers. It's that person who, who has that idea that no one at the table thought of at first that you say, that's actually quite a good idea. From those 
those open meetings, then you can actually create a new group of stakeholders that are interested in meeting regularly. And then strategically and, and quarterly, bringing that type of conversation back to the community. That's the learning cycle that we're referring to when we talk about creating a, a village that's based on learning. Again, not only the parent and the child, but also the community itself. And in that learning cycle, as you say, we have the best, um, Benjamin Franklin said, when he was, they were done with the, with the U.S. Constitution, he said, that is the best we could do with the time we had. And if we had more time, I'm not sure we could do any better. Well, essentially, is we have to create a solution that is designed in order to be implemented. But the design flexibility allows other voices to come in through the process to say, that is the best we could do at the time that it was developed, but we have time to create a better solution. And thus it allows us to act in a, in a time, in, a, in reality, instead of only acting in the time of the past when the meeting was set. And I think that, uh, especially now in the U.S., after the 2005 housing crisis, the change in stock market, the stock market doing well now, the market sometimes doing well, rent, fair market rentals go up and down, incomes go up and down. A village like this has to have a relationship with stakeholders that say, we will, we will change, not the mission, but we will change the expression of the mission to be most effective in the lives of those we serve based on what we're seeing in the market. Interesting. And so are there particular uh, tactics or techniques that you might use in, in dealing with stakeholders? Absolutely. One of the things that, uh, that we do regularly is open community meetings. Uh, right now we're doing, last year we did town hall meetings, which is uh, uh, northern, northern U.S. used to use them a lot and some towns still do, a town hall. It allows everyone just to, to be mad and to hear and to visit. And we actually do those uh, right at the Salvation Army within, within our campus. But we, we brought those out into the community this year with what we refer to as community leadership dialogues. So Florida's Honors College, new college, is here in the community. And so we've engaged the practicum and community building, and we have students from that that work with us every month to bring forward a conversation with uh, both philanthropists, and, and Sarasota, very significant philanthropists, uh, to those who are living with us, students, community activists, community leaders, that engage together around the table to say, here is, here is uh, the discussion of the week, uh, and then bring that out to say, okay, from that shared knowledge, what determinations can we make? After that meeting, we use a Jeffersonian style dinner, which uh, is, allows for one question for the evening, is we invite key stakeholders from different social sectors to a table, uh, roughly 14 to 16 people around the table, and there's one question presented for the evening. And what we find is, is between that large group and that small group, it moves, it moves uh, social and creates social capital so that you say, we want to hear uh, each voice. And at that meeting, it's very important to us that we cross social spectrum. If the Salvation Army only invites those who agree with us, Mm -hmm. Then we are almost like the uh, the university class, where the professor everyone prefers everyone nods their heads, and we very intentionally invite the people at the table who do not agree with us. Absolutely. And what we have found is is that people who were calling us out for policy 18 months ago, now are offering themselves to help us write programs and design, mm -hmm. because we find that we agree on more than we disagree. And so this style allows us not to be separated by our disagreements, but to engage our agreements. Great, thank you. And uh, so when the project's completed, uh, what would the ideal outcome be for your uh, stakeholder management activities? What would you expect to see? I expect that we'll have stakeholders on the property. Uh, the way that we're designing the, the building in the first concepts have meetings rooms for other agencies to be on site. I expect that stakeholders will be able to visit the property and have updates of what's happening. But most importantly, I expect that we'll continue a learning cycle. It's part of our strategy is, is how do we determine how we continue to look. There needs to be a steering committee that says that looks at the economy every year to say what is happening with the housing prices, what is happening with the need. 
because one of the things about the village, if, even if we have 80 or 100 apartments, one of the things about the village is that the village is just one tool in a housing continuum. And the speed that the village uh, assists a family or the amount that the village helps the family get into, uh, into the community will change. We refer to this, this practice as hybrid housing. Hybrid housing uses the effectiveness of social programs with the efficiency of the market. And I would say just as a Toyota or a Nissan has determined over time what, and now Tesla, right, and Mercedes, just what electric looks like in combination with gas. What we need to do is determine what does the nonprofit sector look like with the for-profit sector in allowing people to be housed. We have to rate that against everything from the unemployment rate to the available housing rate and sit and have an engaged conversation with the realities of the market. Thank you. And this is very helpful for the students. So uh, my final question is most of the students who are uh, watching this will be joining the workforce in the not too distant future. Uh, have you any advice for them based on your career thus far? I, I would say fight forward with the hope that brought you into the class on the first day. Wonderful. Second, I'd say, is to be a continual learner. One of the things that the approach that we use is we appreciate people's expertise, but we do not need an expert in the room. Because in situations like this, the problems, get engaged with problems that are so large, that it needs others to be connected so that you can develop solutions that continue to work. Is, uh, some, sometimes people, uh, and, and it happens with, with all courses, uh, people, people decide that they are right and they have the solution. And I would say the greatest learning we have is admitting what we don't know and gathering those around us to make it a bit more known. So be those who connect to others, allow others to connect to you and offer that which you may have expertise in, but be, find it acceptable not to be the expert. Wonderful. And uh, thank you very much for your time today, uh, Major Frizzell. This uh, video is going to be useful to a lot of students from Waterloo and hopefully from elsewhere too. So uh, thanks once again for taking the time to do it. Well, and when, when, uh, when you get closer to, your, to whether it be retirement or just a wonderful trip, come down to Sarasota, meet wonderful people, and stop by the Salvation Army and say, hey, by the way, I saw you with the University of Waterloo. Great. Thank you very much.